Hey everyone, welcome back to the Weekend Charts. Charlie Bellello here, huge show for you today. We have so much to talk about, a lot went on in markets this week. We have the FOMC meeting, we have the inflation report, we have markets hitting new all-time highs, we have historic moves in the bond market, and so much more to discuss today. So stick around to the end, hit that subscribe button if you're watching this on YouTube, and let's begin with that inflation report. And the big question everyone's asking is, is the inflation fight finally over? If we look at CPI, came in at 3.99%. If we look at the core, first reading below 4% that we've seen since September 2021, lowest levels in quite some time. Overall CPI, 3.1%, a little bit better than expected. And Market participants now are forecasting that this is going to continue in 2024. That's why they're getting excited. If we look at where we've come from, just a huge difference between today and where we were in June 2022 when the CPI peaked at 9.1%. With the exception of transportation and shelter, we have every other major component showing a lower rate of inflation today than back then. And if we look at things like fuel oil, gas utilities, gasoline, used cars, we've seen outright declines uh, since then. So a lot of good news in this inflation report. The big factor that's kind of weighing on the overall CPI and definitely core CPI is that shelter component here at 6.5%. But the good news is that it's likely to continue to decline in the coming months so if we take out shelter and i don't really like excluding things especially not the single biggest component which is shelter at over a third of the index but if we take it out we're looking at cpi now year over year of around 1.4 percent and six consecutive months below the fed's kind of two percent target and why does it make some sense for now to keep shelter out of inflation well as we've discussed many times Shelter is a severely lagging indicator. And where it was showing an understatement of inflation in 2021 and 2022, today it's overstating the true housing inflation that's going on today. And if we look at that shelter CPI number still at 6.5%, this is not where the market is today. If we look at actual rents, we're seeing actually a 1% decline over the last year. So this is a huge gap. It's a huge lag, and this is likely to move down significantly in the months to come. We've already seen eight consecutive declines in this year-over-year -year shelter number, but still elevated 6.5%. I expect it's in 2024, definitely in the first half of the year, to start to really move lower as it starts to reflect the real-time data with that long lag. So let's look at this chart here, and I've been showing this for a while now. We talked about in 2021, 2022, first half for sure, there was this huge gap between the reality of housing inflation and what CPI was showing. And slowly but surely, we've seen this gap close with shelter CPI continuing to march higher, whereas actual asking rents have kind of gone, gone sideways now for about a year and a half. So if we actually look since January 2020, now shelter CPI is showing a little bit of a greater increase than actual asking prices of rents. Now, I'm not showing here home prices, which are still way up, way higher than shelter CPI. But the point is that I think we're getting closer to shelter CPI reflecting what's actually gone on, at least in the rental market. And that should mean if shelter CPI is supposed to be a reflection of true housing inflation, that should mean that we should see a rapid deceleration in that shelter CPI number in the coming months. And that in turn should really start to bring down overall inflation, but especially core inflation where it's just a huge, huge waiting there. So it wasn't just CPI, that was good news. This week we had up more evidence of cooling inflation. We got that producer price index, another low reading here, 0.8% increase over the last year so well below the average that we've seen over the last decade and well off obviously that peak from 2022 so good news there on producer prices we also have import prices continuing this downward year-over-year -year trend this is now the 10th straight month where we've had a year-over-year -year decline in import prices down 1.4 percent over the last year 
And if we look at expectations, and this is huge, this is something that the Fed often talks about, I think it's very important, is what are people expecting for inflation? What are businesses expecting for inflation? Because that can become kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in some respects. There's a lot of psychology built into inflation. And the good news is consumers are now expecting much lower inflation than they were in 2022. 3.36% they're expecting over the next year for inflation. That's the lowest expectation we've seen since March 2021. So getting those expectations under control is a huge part of this uh, fight against inflation because if people are expecting high prices, well, they'll be more, more tolerant of them and they may even rush out to buy things because they're expecting prices to go up in the future, which only makes inflation worse. And the fact that they've come down so much now in terms of expectations should be a very good thing. If we're looking at businesses, we're seeing something similar here. 2.4% uh, they're expecting over the next year. That's the lowest reading since March 2021. So many, many different signs of inflation cooling here, which leads us, of course, to the Fed. And the big news this week with that FOMC announcement was kind of this idea that the Fed is finally ready to acknowledge that a pivot is coming in terms of the Fed monetary policy has been tight. We know fastest rate increases since the early 1980s. Uh, but if we look at the Fed's projections, that is going to likely change in 2024. So first, what was the announcement? Well, no, absolutely no surprise. And this is what I, I put out on X every month in advance, a day in advance of the actual announcement, tomorrow's news today. And once again, the Fed did exactly what the market was expecting it to do, which was the Fed held rates at 5.25 to 5.5% and said they're going to continue to shrink their balance sheet. But as I said last week, the big question wasn't going to be what the Fed did at this meeting, which almost everyone said they were going to do nothing holding rates. The big question was going to be for those projections. Was it going to be a hawkish pause? Was it going to be a dovish pause? And the market definitely got what it wanted, which was a very dovish pause. And this is really how it's broken down here. The Fed puts out these projections every every few months in terms of inflation, in terms of unemployment, in terms of the Fed funds rate. And their projection for the Fed funds rate at the end of 2024, they dropped by 50 basis points. So they brought it down from 5.1% down to 4.6%. They also lowered their expectations for 2025 as well. And they lowered their expectations for core PCE, which is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. They pushed it down to 2.4% in 2024, 2.2% in 2025. So Fed's finally acknowledging that they're going to likely start cutting rates next year if these projections are correct. But if you listen to the press conference closely, Powell still is kind of hedging his bet. He still said this isn't set in stone that there's a chance that the Fed could still hike again. Maybe it's not high, but it's still there. And they haven't made any definitive decisions in terms of cutting rates next year. It's going to be a meeting by meeting kind of data dependent decision. And what did the market say? Well, the market said, don't listen to Powell. The Fed is absolutely going to cut rates. We saw a huge shift in terms of market expectations for the, the path of the Fed funds rate a shift lower and a shift upward in terms of timing, where now the market is firmly expecting the Fed to start cutting rates in March 2024. And let's take a look here. I broke it down on X. Uh, what are the expectations from the market? The market's saying that the Fed is going to start cutting in March, do it again in May, again in June, 25 basis point cuts, hold in July, then three more. So six cuts in total for next year. That's three more cuts than what the Fed is currently projecting. So the, the market's not only saying the Fed's going to cut rates next year and they're going to start in March, even though they're saying that, that they're still talking about possible rate hikes. The market's saying, no, forget that. The Fed's definitely going to cut rates and they're going to be much more aggressive in cutting rates than they're projecting currently. So very dovish interpretation from the market. And as we'll talk about in a little bit, equities rallied even more on that news. They had been rallying over the past few weeks. 
and they continued to rally after they got this news. So let's take a look at the global central bank uh, snapshot here. This is what I look, like to look at in terms of is policy e on the easy end, is it on the tight end? And a year ago, there was a lot more work to be done. If we look at this real central bank rate a year ago, a lot of negative numbers still. And so we saw a lot of hikes to get that back into balance. And now many of these central banks, like the Fed, can start cutting rates if they so choose. So it's already begun, as we talked about in Latin America. We've seen cuts in Brazil, in Chile, in Peru. Obviously, China is still very slowly easing, may continue to do so there as well. But the big question for next year is going to be the Fed, is going to be the ECB, is going to be the Bank of England. Are they going to start easing rates? Because inflation is now moving back towards their target levels. So U.S. at 3.1%. The target is obviously 2% for the Fed. And Powell has asked, well, do you have to get to 2% before you start cutting rates? And he said, no, then we would be behind the curve. We could do it before that point. So he's kind of signaling, we don't have to wait for that 2% target. Uh, we can do it before then, but they're not quite there just yet. So January meeting, unlikely. But I think if they're going to cut in March, they would send a pretty strong signal in that January meeting that they're going to do so. So 2024 looks to be very different in terms of, of uh, central bank policy. We've had a few years where central banks were largely behind the curve in terms of uh, inflation running up, and they were slow to attack that. Fed, especially uh, in that camp. But now the question is, are they being too slow on the other end to cut rates? Uh, and that remains to be seen. And obviously, if inflation starts to pick up again, uh, the Fed's going to be a little bit more reluctant, I would say, to carry out the market's plan. So for now, market's interpretation, this is the Goldilocks scenario where they're saying there's not going to be a recession. It's going to be a soft landing and the Fed is going to cut rates uh, because uh, they can essentially that inflation is back under control and they can start to ease policy before we get to the point where there's an actual recession. So what's one other reason why the Fed might be influenced to cut rates next year? It is an election year. There's going to be, I think, increasing pressure in terms of what the fiscal situation is. And even though Powell hasn't admitted as much, I do think this is in the back of their mind as well. The interest expense on U.S. national debt, which continues to march higher at a rapid pace, hit $949 billion over the last year. So we're getting close to that trillion dollar number. And a lot of that, as we talked about, is short term debt, which the Fed can influence the inf interest rate on that debt. And if they can, if they can start cutting rates, that would alleviate, I think, obviously, some of this pain, even though if you keep adding debt at the rate we're adding, uh, even if interest rates come, come down, let's say 100 basis points next year in terms of the Fed funds rate, it's still going to be very high in terms of interest expense. But this is another factor the Fed hasn't talked about, but is, I think, likely in their back of their, their minds as well. So we'll see. As we have always talked about, the market expectations can change very fast. And it's a very benign uh, expectation in terms of what the market is saying right now. And we know a lot of can change between now and March to change those expectations. So what did the markets do after the Fed meeting? They were running up before that, but they just surged higher. They love the fact that the Fed is going to switch back to an easing policy. And we had the Dow actually hit an all-time high that day. 37,000 crossed above for the first time. It took 772 days for the Dow to hit 37,000 hit that next $1,000, 1,000 level higher. 36,000 was reached in November, 2021. It took 772 days to get to that 37,000 level. So first all time high we've seen from the Dow uh, since early 2022. And that keeps the streak alive, at least for the Dow. The S&P is still a little bit off on a price basis uh, in terms of its all time high. But the Dow now has hit an all-time high, 11 years in a row. Pretty incredible. The only stretch where we've seen more consecutive years with at least one all-time high was 1989 to 2000, and that was 12 straight years. So we go into 2024 at new highs. We hit a new high uh, in, in 2024. 
uh, we're going to have tied that record run from 1989 to 2000. So pretty remarkable. Seemed unlikely at the beginning of the year, but huge surge higher in the markets this year. And uh, just a, another reason to say throw out all and any forecast because the market is kind of always doing things that seem impossible. And this is just another example. So it wasn't just the Dow. Dow was the only major index on a price basis to hit an all-time high so far. But on a total return basis, the band is back together. And this is a chart illustrating that. We have the Dow ETF, S&P 500 ETF, NASDAQ 100 ETF. So the DIA, SPY, QQQ ETFs, all closing at an all-time high together this week. And the last time that happened, you have to go all the way back to November 5th, 2021. So it's been a while, but the band is back together. And if we look at the S&P 500 total return index, that's at an all-time high, first all-time high since early 2022. And what a lot of people wonder about all-time highs is that a reason to sell is a reason to be more bullish is there some type of signal in terms of markets hitting an all-time high and talked about this before but want to emphasize it again an all-time high by itself is not a reason to sell it's not a reason to buy the data is pretty clear on this i went back to 1928 looking at monthly closing data s p closes on a total return basis at an all-time high what happens over the next one year, three year, five year, 10 year? Do we see a bearish implication here? Not at all. We're seeing markets tend to be higher one year, three year, five year, really no different than when the market is at not at an all-time high. So all-time high, not a signal of anything. What it tends to be followed historically is by more all-time highs. So that should be the base case expectation, of course, at some point, and we saw this in early 2022, there will be an all-time high that is the peak of that cycle. You'll have a bear market, but nobody can tell you, of course, when exactly that's going to occur. And an all-time high by itself, as we saw looking at that Dow chart, let's go back to here. If you said in 2013, gosh, Dow's back at an all-time high, first time since 2007, let me get out. It's probably the top you would have obviously missed a decade of gains for the market and many more all-time highs. So let's talk about the bond market. Just an incredible two months for the bond market and really two years of returns we've seen for the bond market in just two months. Absolutely incredible move higher in the bond market. What set the stage for this? Well, it's what we were talking about in October. We had the best perspective returns for the bond market since 2007, we had that 10-year hitting 5%. We had bond yields uh, across the board, investment grade bond yields, around 5%. High yield was even higher investment grade. Corporates were even higher than that. But that 5% yield was projecting the best forward returns for the bond market since 2007. And so what you should have expected at the end of October is about 5% per year looking out over the next seven years. But what I said at the time is, you don't know how that 5% is going to be achieved. Uh, yields could have went higher from there and bond prices lower or bonds prices could have uh, uh, gone up because yields fell. Any number of combinations, you don't know that part of it isn't, pre isn't predictable, but the long-term returns for bond uh, investors looked much, much better. And historically, that would have meant around 5% per year. What we actually saw is 5% per month over the last two months. So two years of returns really we've gotten for the bond market in two months. And what was driving that? Well, just a massive move lower in treasury yields. So the market obviously anticipating that the Fed is going to pivot. Market always moves before the Fed. This is no exception here. If we look at one year treasury yields down 59 basis points, two years down 82 basis points from their peak in October and the 10 year enormous move 106 basis points from the peak in october so less than two months 10 year goes from 498 on a closing basis to 392 so just an unbelievable move and obviously in the short run what are bonds influenced by direction of interest rates so interest rates rising was a big problem for the bond market for a number of years and this rapid 
decline in yields. We're seeing the opposite where prices are rising here. And this is just an incredible chart looking at the US bond market ETF versus a cash like ETF. So looking at a treasury bill ETF and the gap was enormous here at the end of October. The bonds were down a few percent on the year and cash was up over 4% on the year. And people were saying things like, why should I take any risk in bonds when I can just buy treasury bills and earn 5%? Well, as we said at the time, you're not guaranteed to get that 5% forever. And if you wanna lock in some of these higher yields, well, now would be an interesting time to do so. And what we've seen is just an enormous move, about 10% move higher in the US bond market ETF. And now it's actually outpacing cash on the year. So unbelievable move in bonds. And what was the bond market reacting on? Well, my belief is it was front running that Fed pivot. So people were expecting the Fed to change their projections. That's exactly what they did. And we talked about this a few months ago, but during Fed rate cutting cycles, you see, tend to see very strong returns for the bond market. And we've seen this in many, many cycles across the board. Every time the Fed since 1980 has had a rate cutting cycle, bonds have been up and usually up better than their historical average. Now, in the last two months, I would say they've pulled forward a lot of the return for, that you would typically get from a rate cutting cycle. Now, we don't know, maybe the Fed's gonna end up cutting rates back to zero and uh, and the returns will still be very strong for the bond market. But I think very quickly here, bond market investors have started to price in uh, Fed cuts for next year. And so we'll see how this plays out. But as we said a few months ago, you can't wait until the actual response to be invested in an asset class. You have to be in that asset class before the move and since returns aren't linear, what you have to do as an investor is to be there in advance. And we saw that in the bond market over the last two months, just an unbelievable spike higher. Nobody was expecting such a move. I certainly wasn't uh, from 5% 5, 5 on the 10 year to below 4%, but that's the nature of mar markets. It's constantly doing things uh, that are, are unexpected. So will be very interesting in 2024 to see how many times the Fed hikes, if they do indeed hike, obviously it's not set in stone and how the bond market reacts. But for now, if you've been a bond investor, you've been buying as yields have been going up, you're feeling very, very good about things right now. And not just in terms of the Bloomberg Ag or broad bond market uh, funds. If you look at corporate bonds, had an incredible year here because yields are down and spreads are tighter. So the combination of the two have really lifted high yield bonds or junk bonds and investment grade bonds. And just took a look here at high yield bonds and investment grade bonds from their peak yields in October. What a, what a huge move lower here from 945 on the uh, a yield on the junk bond uh, index here in October, 750 today. So 195 basis point move lower from 9.45% down to 7.5%. And investment grade bonds, 6.44% down to 5.18%. And that alone obviously lifts the prices of these bonds. But in addition to this, we're seeing spreads tighten. So that's a, an additional boost. We're looking at high yield credit spreads here down to 3.47% tightest now since April, 2022. So the market moving further and further away from talk, the pricing in some kind of a recession. Uh, when you see recession risk rise, you tend to see credit spreads widen, increase. This is the spread between a junk bond or high, high yield bond and the, uh, uh, the spread between junk bonds and similar duration treasury securities, so risk-free securities. And when the spread is high, markets are pricing in higher defaults they're worried about a recession and when the spread is low you're seeing the opposite so tightest spreads we've seen since april 2022 in junk bonds and investment grade bonds tightest spread since january 2022 which is when the equity bear market began so looking at 104 basis points in terms of investment grade credit spreads definitely now below the historical average and people who invested in investment grade bonds a few months ago could have locked in over six percent 
uh, you know, in terms of future returns, you tend to have very uh, small defaults in the investment grade market. So again, they're, they're going to be feeling uh, pretty good about things, I think, as well. So all around for the bond market went from a not very good year with the exception of things like floating rate issues, leverage loans were doing well, junk bonds were doing okay. Went from that two months ago to now all bonds starting to do well and participate and uh, very quickly uh, the 60-40 portfolio that people were saying uh, was dead just a few months ago, it's come alive uh, and then some. So let's talk about the unexpected relationship between the Fed's interest rate hikes and the S&P 500. And if we look at the Fed hikes here, started in March 2022, continued and we started at zero, essentially. They hiked 25 basis points. Then they sped up the hikes to 75 basis points four times in a row, ended up hiking all the way from zero to 5.25 to 5.5%. Cumulative increase, 525 basis points. And a lot of people were saying during this period of time, you can't be invested in stocks until the Fed cuts rates. The uh, market is going to collapse because of these rate hikes. And what we showed historically was that the last bunch of cycles, the market actually was higher from the beginning of the rate hikes to the end of it. And that's exactly what we've seen this time around as well. Since the Fed started hiking rates in March 2022, the S&P 500 is now 8% higher than back then. So 525 basis points of increases and the S&P 500 is still higher. Yes, we did have a bear market in between, but we've recovered and on a total return basis, we're at a new to all time high. The price basis, we're almost there. What I always say about the Fed, it's not so much don't fight the Fed or fight the Fed, these, these uh, sayings, it's that the Fed isn't as important as market participants put the weighting on the Fed. The market participants often say the Fed is everything. You have to follow their every move. You have to listen to every word. But if you look historically at the relationship between the Fed funds rate and future returns for the stock market, there isn't a strong relationship whatsoever. And we've seen the market do very well from very high Fed funds rates in the past. So right now, Fed funds rate is here in this range here in the fourth quintile. We've seen the market in the past do just fine going forward. We've actually seen the best returns historically when the Fed funds rate was above 7%. And that was coming, obviously, in the early 1980s. We had strong market returns after that. But even in terms of the Fed tightness or easiness, so we compare the Fed funds rate to CPI, look at the real Fed funds rate. So now... We have the highest real Fed funds rate since 2007. That's scaring a lot of people. Well, historically, we've seen the best returns when the Fed was at, following the periods when the Fed was actually the tightest. And the overall message isn't that it's bad or, or good, Fed's easy or tight. It's that the market, independent of the Fed, has found a way to be higher on a long-term basis, regardless of where the Fed funds rate is, and regardless of what Fed policy is. And I think that's just a testament to businesses, corporations, continue to grow earnings. They find a way to adapt to the environment that they're in. I saw that especially in 2022 in terms of cost cutting and businesses got very lean, especially in the technology space. Profits recovered this year, and with that, markets recovered and then some. So uh, just an important lesson here. You can listen to the Fed. It's not that they don't have any impact on the economy or perhaps sentiment in the short run in the stock market. It's that if you're a long-term investor, you shouldn't be making buy or sell decisions based on what the Federal Reserve is doing. So let's talk about mean reversion. Is it dead? And that question really comes about from three secular trends that have been going on for well over a decade. Number one, large caps outperforming small caps. Number two, growth outperforming value. Number three, U.S. outperforming international stocks. And the big question, I think, for 2024 is, are we going to see a mean reversion here? We saw that in 2022, but all of these factors have come back in 2023, where we're seeing U.S. outperformance again, growth outperformance, large cap outperformance. 
And again, these are long, long trends over a decade long. And a lot of people are saying mean reversion is dead. We're not going to see uh, small caps value or international ever outperform in the future. I'm skeptical of that, of course. And I think, as I always say, the best time to think about diversifying into an asset class is when it's unloved, when it's so painful to do so. And we definitely have that situation looking at small caps or value stocks or international stocks. And if we look at emerging markets, this is a very extreme, very long period of underperformance here. We went from a period where emerging markets were really loved in looking at 2010 uh, to a period now where emerging markets are absolutely hated. It's the lowest relative strength for emerging markets. So comparing emerging market performance to S&P 500 performance, lowest since November 2001. So very few people are thinking emerging markets can outperform going forward in the future. In the short run, I have absolutely no opinion on this, but it seems to be the case historically that these things tend to go in cycles and the cycles can last for a long time. And perhaps we're in, going to be in the future, see a cycle where emerging markets outperform. Again, the big question within emerging markets, and I think rightfully so, is with China and China being the biggest weighting on the index. It's anywhere from 25% of the index to over 30% of the index, depending on what index that you're looking at. And I think the big question there is, is China going to find a way out of its doldrums? Are shareholders of Chinese companies going to benefit uh, from the actual growth in those companies? Is there risk in terms of tail risk, in terms of there's a conflict with Taiwan and other things? All of these are reasons why emerging markets have been doing so poorly. China has been doing so poorly. Obviously, they have a big issue with their housing market. They have slower growth. They're actually reporting not just lower inflation, but prices going down. Uh, so there's any number of reasons. But the question for an investor is how much of this is priced in? And if we look at the relative valuations between the US, which is still very much on the higher end, if we look at globally in terms of stocks and compare that to emerging markets on the lower end in terms of valuations, the question is, well, how much is that of that is priced in? And are, are investors not their investors are kind of assuming today that the U.S. will have nothing but good news going forward and emerging markets and international stocks will continue to have bad news. And that might be the case, uh, but historically, these things have kind of been cyclical and perhaps we're uh, getting closer to a place where we're going to see a shift in terms of this long-term cycle. Is mean reversion dead? I don't think so, uh, but this just proves that the cycle can last a lot longer uh, than you think it can. And here we are over a decade of underperformance for emerging market stocks and just a huge, huge underperformance uh, over that period of time. So I want to talk about sentiment very quickly here. From fearful to greedy is what the market has done over the last year in terms of the sentiment of the average participant. If we're looking at this AAII sentiment survey, last uh, December, bears outnumber bulls at one point by 32 percent huge spread many more bears than bulls the latest reading that came out this week bulls outnumbered bears by 32 percent so an enormous enormous shift over the last year and why the change why are people suddenly more bullish today than they were a year ago well you have the s p 500 25 percent higher NASDAQ 100, 55% higher than last December when this negative poll came out. So incredible move higher in prices, and that gets investors excited. There's nothing that excites investors more than not just rising prices, but rapidly rising prices. And we've seen that over the past year. And there's nothing that gets investors more negative on the markets and falling prices and rapidly falling prices. And we saw that obviously last year. So what a difference a year makes in terms of sentiment. As we talked about in 2022, when this is at an extreme fearful reading, you tend to see above average returns over the next year. We've seen more than that over the past year. So we've seen that and then some, but we also noted when you start to see extreme greed, 
you don't necessarily see negative returns. So it's not the same indicator, but you tend to see actually on average, below average returns for the stock market going forward. Now, does that mean the stock market's going to be down over the next year? No, on average, it's still higher, but your expectations should be not as bullish for the market today as compared to a year ago, which should make sense. Prices were much lower a year ago, expectations were lower. And so the forward return prospects should have been better. Now prices are higher, earnings have gone up, but stock prices have gone up more than earnings. So valuations have expanded and the return prospects are lower. So this fear and greed cycle for investors, never going to change. It's just basic human behavior. Investors get more excited when prices are up and they get more despondent when prices are down, which is of course the exact opposite of how they should be feeling. If you're a long-term investor, you have 20 years, you're buying into the market every paycheck with your 401k or an IRA, you should much rather be seeing prices go down because you're not selling, you're able to buy in at lower prices, then prices go up. But most people don't think like that. They want to see prices go up and they get more bullish. So we'll check in on this in 2024 and see how this changes. Obviously, there's going to be a correction in 2024. And when there is, I fully expect sentiment to start to shift back in the other direction. So I wanna end as I always do on a positive note. There's a lot of positive things we talked about today. Uh, but the most positive thing for this week is this trend of wages outpacing inflation continuing. And CPI report had a lot of good stats, but my favorite was that food price inflation continues to fall. So down now to 1.7%. Great news. Food prices going down is, is the best news in the report by far. This is something that we all obviously need to buy. We can't substitute it. And 13.5% food price inflation was killing people last year because their wages weren't going up anywhere near that much. And 1.7%, much better place. As I've said, I'd love to see this go negative uh, in the coming six months or 12 months. That would be awesome, but I'll take 1.7% for now. Now, in terms of rent, uh, we're seeing, we saw last week, we noted data from apartment list in terms of rents going down. Now we have data from Redfin saying uh, asking rents down 2% over the last year. So very good news. If you're in the market looking for a new apartment, rents are going down year over year, and at least they're not hitting new highs. So unlike home prices, as we talked about, that have continued to hit new highs uh, this year and mortgage rates are obviously much higher. Well, unlike that, we're actually seeing the rental market get more affordable because people's wages are going up and rents are coming down a little bit, which is good news. And then we have gas prices, uh, $3.10 a gallon nationally. This is a national average. So if you're in California, don't yell at me. <laughs> I feel your pain. I'm in New York. Uh, prices are higher than this year as well, but uh, $3.10 a gallon nationally. Very good uh, news. This trend that we've seen over the past few months is the lowest level so far this year. And this is good news, obviously, for the December uh, inflation report. We're only halfway through the month, but should be good news for that as well. So if we look at hourly earnings over the last year, about 4% increase, still above historical average. And the important thing now is that inflation is lower than this. And we have 3.1% uh, CPI over the last year. So that spread is what historically over the long term leads to the prosperity of a nation and its people people within that nation. And so now we've seen seventh consecutive month of positive real hourly earnings. So earnings, your earnings increase in, in your wages are going up more than inflation for now seven consecutive months on a year over year basis. And this is a trend that I expect will continue for December. And I hope it will continue throughout 2024. All right. So we covered a lot of ground today. Uh, thank you for joining me. Have a great weekend, everyone. And I'll see you next time on the Week in Charts.